This is Sonia Wagner representing PCA families in one of our recordings designed to capture lived experience and best practice research-based learning that assists kinship, permanent and adoptive parents and carers in supporting young people. We are a child safe organisation. We pay respects to elders past and present, acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land and express our intention to move together to a place of justice and partnership. Being able to learn from peers and connect with those who may help us is particularly important. Today, we're discussing how to help the brain recover from trauma with behavior change therapist, Chris Storm. Chris is a registered sensory motor art therapist, Clayfield therapist and somatic experiencing counselor whose desire to keep learning more about how to help others has led her down many pathways. Chris had experience with youth justice, homelessness, family violence, specialist teaching, and always felt like she could be more useful. So this led her to further study where she qualified as a sensory motor art therapist and somatic body based practitioner. She rounded that out with a master's in experiential learning development, training as a play therapist, training in Deb Dana's rhythm of regulation, a polyvagal approach to regulation, and Stephen Porges' safe and sound protocol. Welcome, Chris. It sounds like you're someone that truly wants to understand the brain and the body, leaving no stone unturned. <laughs> Hi, Sonia. Thank you. And I just like to um, honour the um, or pay my respects to the traditional owners of where I'm sitting at the moment, um, the Wadawurrung lands of the great part of the Great Kulin Nation down here in Victoria. Oh, lovely. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I think uh, I think one of the things that uh, in talking about it, because it's quite a mouthful to explain all of that to clients in some of my um, training and studies. Yes. So I often I often use the uh, the expression that therapy is a little bit like building a house. Yes. And the way that I work is that um, you, you wouldn't build a, a, a big two story house if the foundations weren't solid. Yes. So I often let them know I am the slab. I am the foundations. And from there, <laughs> you can go off in any direction because um, that helps to support their, their very base understanding of the felt sense of what they might be carrying inside their body. Yes. Yes. Um, yes. And so as I'm multimodal trained, as you've mentioned, this helps me to work and support them from a perspective of, what is it they need instead of what is what's wrong with them yeah absolutely That's so important so uh, you remind me of something that I'm always telling my kids about with their mathematics learning is to keep building that foundation <laughs> absolutely <laughs> so uh, look I wonder if we can talk about some of those different modalities if you like and and how they work either individually or in conjunction with others and maybe talk to some specific examples um, so our, our listeners can kind of understand a bit more about how it works in practice as well so um, I wondered if we could start off with play therapy and um, learning a bit more about that yeah absolutely yeah. so I'm uh, specifically trained in trained in child-centered play therapy Mm -hmm. So that's a, that's a particular model. And I tend to use this with the younger children. So what it is, is that play is the work of children. Mm -hmm. And um, the play may offer some insight into their anxieties, uh, unresolved problems, emotions, or any traumatic experiences that they might have had. Mm -hmm. Or it can off also offer learning um, new coping mechanisms or perhaps uh, help them to read or help me to redirect inappropriate behavior mm -hmm. so it's really important in this model of child center play therapy that the play is child-led yes for example yes. the ability to hold space for a child while they engage in the play of their choosing mm -hmm. that might actually be the first time that that has been able to happen for that child mm -hmm. and it requires a really sound base of safety for that to occur mm -hmm. yeah um, right, and yeah. so just just to have being able to hold that hold that space for them mm -hmm. and um, increase their felt sense of safety through through doing different activities mm -hmm. with them mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah. yeah that could be the first time that they've had that and it right. can be quite quite um, in one session there can be a significant shift for some children mm. can you talk to something specific that you've sort of seen or or done with a child 
Um, yeah, well, I think um, interestingly, it's uh, I do a, a parent intake or a carer intake when I um, first start working with children, mm-hmm. and and I get the story from the parents about what's been happening for the child. So there's this scenario painted that is indicating anxieties or right. Uh, yeah, I think anxiety is a good cover or word for some word yeah. for some of the things that the children go through. Yes, and uh, so then when I the child's brought in to me, and I bring the child then into the playroom and go through the process of introducing them to the space and some of the expectations about what happens in the space, mm-hmm. um, and then they explore and they do things, and they're constantly you can see them constantly waiting for me to say, "Don't do that. Put that." down be careful I don't think so which is often the experience of small children right when they're going into a new space Mm -hmm. Um, and when they finally work out that oh it's it's actually okay for me to touch this it's okay for me to tip this all out on the floor and then go to something else without actually picking up after myself that that Mm. isn't kind of there aren't conditions around participating yes yes (laughs) So with that freedom then comes this uh, ability to engage and what I, what I then take from the playroom to return to the parent or carer is a child that is in a different place of regulation and so they can often seem much more settled, much more happy and much more um, content to engage, to make that eye contact and engage happily back with the parent. Mm-hmm. So I've seen children go from jumping around all over the place in the playroom with me, taking them back into the into the waiting room and having them run with big smiles into the arms of their parents and their parents being quite surprised because that isn't the child that they dropped off. At the <laughs> They've had their needs met. That's brilliant. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, and that leads me on to the rhythm of regulation. Uh, it's very related to what you've just talked about. So I wonder if you could talk about that a little bit more. Sure. So rhythm of regulation, um, that comes from a woman called Deb Dana. Mm -hmm. She was the creator of this program and uh, she's a clinician, a US clinician who applies polyvagal theory Mm -hmm. to relationships, uh, mental health and trauma. So polyvagal theory actually um, involves becoming more attuned to what the body may be holding and supporting opportunities to work on self-regulation and co-regulation. So learning what it is that you can engage with that helps your system to feel in a, in a safer place mm-hmm. as opposed to being in an unsafe place. And then with the unsafety comes a certain response that comes up. Okay. Yeah, so um, an example of the way I might use this is that she uh, has a tool which is about Uh, mapping the autonomic nervous system Mm -hmm. and that helps to uh, someone to have a greater understanding of each of these nervous system states Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. and ways that I do this with with children it includes engaging them in being curious about what they might be feeling in their body Mm -hmm. and what they might need when they're stuck or feeling unsure about what to do next Mm -hmm. so it's, it's that lovely flow that happens in life because life is flow it's it's up and down it's you know it's you know yes. we're, we're really just great big jellyfish when you think about it yes and um being able to become attuned to that when i'm when i feel scared i get a sick feeling in my tummy and and what do you need type of yes. thing to come from that those conversations um, I, what I'm trying to do is skill children up to be able to utilise these things when I'm not in the same space with them. Absolutely. It's so important to listen to those sort of instincts, isn't it? So yeah, um, you reminded me of a time when I was in the snow on top of a mountain and never in my life have I sat at the top of a mountain and just said, I have this feeling I just don't want to go down this <laughs> this run. I had lots of younger children with me. I was a teenager. Um and five minutes later, the lift stopped and everyone had to walk up this mountain. So, um, wow. so when you talk about listening to your body and what it's telling you, you know, I've got some lived yeah. experience of really needing to, Absolutely. to listen, even though it seems strange at the time, perhaps. So Yeah. yeah. And in reality, we all have it because our bodies are amazing things. They're designed to keep us alive and safe. Yes. Yes. However, somewhere along our journey, 
things may have um, interrupted our ability to be able to listen. Yes. yes, and to back yes. yourself, I guess. So, yeah. for sure. For yeah. Sure. So that leads me on to the Safe and Sound Protocol. Um, oh, the Safe and Sound Protocol is one of my favourite things to talk to clients <laughs> about and to have them engage with. So it's a, it's a listening or an auditory intervention, mm-hmm. and it helps with calming and felt safety, and it's mm-hmm. particularly applicable to things like trauma, anxiety, behaviour regulation, social and emotional difficulties, um, inattention and focus. Mm-hmm. So the, there's, there's, uh, there's two versions, really. There's the original one, which was a hard copy that came on an MP3 player. Right. And yeah. It had one, one five-hour block of music on there. Um, and now they've brought out a digital version, and that involves three parts. Uh, one's called Connect, one's called Core, and one's called Balance. So the Connect is an introductory program. Mm-hmm. The Core is the same as what the previous hard copy version was, and the Balance is an integration program. And these can all be done at home if home is a safe place for the client. Right. So when I deliver the um, uh, Safe and Sound Protocol, or we call it the SSP. So when I deliver mm-hmm. the SSP in mm-hmm. clinic, I tend to focus just on the core, which is the five-hour listening program that kickstarts the nervous system. Mm-hmm. So if, if conditions are right, I'll deliver it for one hour a day for five consecutive days. And what happens is the music impacts on the twitch muscles of the middle ear. Wow. And they are, wow. they're supported to the vagus nerve. So that actually... Um, Oh, sorry, they're connected to the vagus nerve. So that actually means that it's supporting vagal toning mm-hmm. and, and that contributes to what Porges, uh, a term that Porges made, which is neuroception. And neuroception mm-hmm. is about how we perceive safety and unsafety. So it contri- contributes to the neuroception of safety. Great. Okay. And it's really, really important that the safe in part of the safe and sound is adhered to. So one way this can be done is through meeting any eye contact that happens during the session with soft, kind eyes, Mm -hmm. as eyes are a very important component of social engagement. Okay. And so often social engagement occurs from like here up. Okay. And the um, smiles and things happens as well, but it's about what our eyes can see and what it's perceiving happening. So okay. our ears, our eyes, and the prosody, the tone of our voice. Mm-hmm. So um, that's uh, that's something that can be really useful with children and teens that might be on the spectrum. Yes. So um, I guess I can give you an example of this. Yeah. Um, was one child I was supporting who was completely disengaged from their family. Right. And after completing the SSP, they were in, starting to initiate social conversations playing board games and laughing. Wow. And it, they might sound like very small things. Oh, but anyone who has a child who has disengaged from them mm-hmm. would see this as gold. Absolutely. And in such as a gold. short amount of time from the sounds of it too. That's Yeah. 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 And it, it can be tweaked. If someone's nervous system is particularly hypersensitive, then you can deliver it in half hour or 15 minute blocks. Okay. Yeah. So it's and it's so it's important. This has to be done accompanied by a trained practitioner. Mm-hmm. So it's not something people can just access by themselves and do it at home because there needs to be support if activation occurs. Yes. yes. Okay. Yes. Well, it's a, it's a small time commitment, really, in the overall scheme of things. If you I can have so. those sort of outcomes, yes. so absolutely. I mean, I've got some yeah. clients that contact me every year to do it because they see it as a. Um, there's two programs that are supported by the organisation that runs this. One's mm-hmm. called the Focus Program, which is a long-term um, 40 sessions, 60 sessions, 30 sessions type program. Right. And there's the SSP. So I often describe SSP as like the vitamin shot in the arm and the Focus Program is the long-term therapy that you can take your time with as you go through. Okay, brilliant. And somatic experiencing. This is fascinating oh, work. <laughs> yeah, so this somatic experiencing is the work of, uh, comes from the work of Peter Levine. Mm-hmm. So it's um, one way to describe it is that it's a journey of self-discovery of one's own body mm-hmm. where you're actually drawing strength from your own inner resources to improve um, cognition and emotional function. So it's actually 
using um, your own felt sense in your body mm -hmm. to support um, every other part of the way that you function in the world. Mm -hmm. So it, it recognises the body gets stuck as mm -hmm. it remembers mm -hmm. or re-experiences various situations that come from the past. Mm -hmm. So these situations could be things where um, there was an active response that was unable to be um, taken up mm -hmm. or was interrupted or mm -hmm. thwarted at the time. So it, um, by actually getting in touch with that uh, rupture in, mm -hmm. in the response and working to either complete it or repair it mm -hmm. through using the felt sense and sensation, mm -hmm. um, it enables that how, how it can hold someone back mm -hmm. to be removed. So you okay. can't stop the fact that someone's had an adverse experience or trauma. That that's the reality. It's it's there, mm -hmm. and it's it's occurred. But mm -hmm. what you can do, I often describe it as you can take the sting out of it, or okay. you can take the hold it has over you away. Okay. So that eventually, once you've processed and worked through this stuff, eventually what happens at the other end is you can actually um, think or talk about the incident. And it doesn't re-traumatise you. Great. Can you tell us about some child-specific examples potentially? Yeah. So um, I guess somatic uh, or SE, there's the, these little acronyms yeah. for all of us. <laughs> <laughs> so SE work probably underpins most of the work I do now. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's about me watching the child's physiology. Mm -hmm. It's about me listening to what they're saying. Mm -hmm. And I mean, really listening to mm -hmm. what they're saying mm -hmm. and, and not making assumptions or giving directives about what they have to do. Okay. So if, if they talk about, I'll use the tummy, the tummy example again, if they mm -hmm. talk about that they're feeling a bit icky in their tummy, mm -hmm. then there might be um, some exploration comes from me about, Oh, I wonder what your icky tummy needs. Mm -hmm. um, or is there any place? Is there any place in your body that doesn't feel icky? Mm -hmm. And give them an example of the difference that's happened. These are just very kind of snippets yes. of what could happen. Yes. So I don't. I don't tend to do pure SE with children. Okay. Uh, yeah. But all of the therapies. I engage with have mm. somatic components to them so mm. it's like I said it weaves its way through yeah. the lot. so how might they respond when you're asking them about the tummy and why they think um, they feel a bit icky and I guess I'm thinking about those children that sometimes you know kind of struggle to identify why they're feeling what they're feeling do you do you find that they can can talk to those sort of things um, I guess one of the things that probably important to mention here is that mm. I, I don't really conduct talk therapy with children. So it's not a lot of talking about yes. how yes. they're feeling now, what do they need all the time. It's just if, if they give me an invitation to go there, mm -hmm. I will go there. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's more about um, giving gentle, gentle suggestions if they're doing something that might need a bit of extra work. So if we're in the sand tray, mm -hmm. it might be um, sort of just noticing how it feels to, to pick up the sand. Does it feel soft? Does it feel cold? Does it anything, things like that. And then if they've got the um, using things like Play-Doh. So it's about engaging some of this with the hands. Some yes. of that work is yes. really important. And um, and getting them to work out what feels good for them and what doesn't. Okay. Yep. Makes sense. Yep. <laughs> and yep. um, sensory motor therapy. Yeah. Well, this general. is probably yeah. So this is probably more the polyvagal based part of the therapy. Mm -hmm. So it's generally about working on the nervous system. And again, polyvagal. That's Stephen Porges' work. Mm -hmm. And when I'm saying the nervous system, what I'm actually talking about is the auto. You've frozen. Nervous system, which is both a motor and a sensory system. 
There we go. Uh, I've frozen. Okay. <laughs> oh, you're fine now. We're good. We're back. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Sorry right. to interrupt you. That's all right. Yes, yeah, all right. Zoom glitches. We're all learning to live with them. <laughs> <laughs> So the, uh, perhaps if I just explain what um, polyvagal theory covers in the autonomic nervous system. So the autonomic nervous system has two main channels, mm -hmm. one that's referred to as sympathetic mm -hmm. and one that's referred to as parasympathetic. Mm -hmm. And so the sympathetic uh, nervous system runs from the back of your skull way down to the tip of your spine. Mm -hmm. And it has little nerve branches that go out to various parts of your body. Mm -hmm. And that's the, sim the system of mobilisation. So when the body perceives something as being dangerous, mm -hmm. um, then it will activate a response from the body. Remember, mm -hmm. our job is to stay to heal and to keep safe. So it activates a response in us, mm -hmm. which means that it sends messages to the, to the organs, to the muscles, to different parts of our body, that get ready, you're going to need to run away or you're going to need to stand there and fight. Mm -hmm. and so it's for that reason, it's often referred to as the fight or flight response. Okay, yep. And the second, the second part of the parasympathetic nervous system, that actually consists of two parts. One which is up the top part, which is from the diaphragm up, and mm -hmm. one which is from the diaphragm down. So mm -hmm. this is uh, a part of the significant contribution that Stephen Porge has made to understanding this part of our, our system. So the, the bottom part is part that's referred to as the dorsal vagus. Mm -hmm. And that is the immobilization part of the system. So mm -hmm. again, the body takes in its surroundings, perceives anything that is life threat, Mm -hmm. And then it, as it different to the mobilization, it's the immobilization. So it actually um, sending blood and oxygen away from activation responses so that your body shuts down. Mm -hmm. And it's mostly based below the heart area mm -hmm. and specifically around the gut. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So that's the that's the dorsal, which is the shutdown or immobilization. Mm -hmm. So we've got mobilization sympathetic. Dorsal shutdown, immobilization. And then the second part of the parasympathetic nervous system is called the ventral vagus. And that basically goes from the diaphragm up. Mm -hmm. And so that's the part of the system that is involved in social engagement and connection. Okay. So interestingly, you need to have a felt sense of safety in order to engage in ventral activation. Yep. And that, that's another important thing to remember when you're working with people who've been impacted by traumatic or adverse experiences. Mm -hmm. it, it really can't be activated just because you tell it to. Yep. You actually have to feel it. Yeah. And so yeah. that can't happen unless people feel safe. Yeah. So one of the things that I would do with someone is to establish what I often refer to as an anchor, mm -hmm. and that is to talk about something that even just thinking about it, a person, place or thing or experience, even just thinking about it, you can feel your face starting to smile. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And once, once I can identify or support them to identify that, when I notice them going into overwhelm, I can talk to them and say, okay, for example, the beach. So let's go to the beach. Let's just listen to the waves in the water, listen to the seabirds, smell the salty air, feel the breeze on your skin and the warm sun and get them to experience that thing that gives them pleasure through many of their senses. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, um, the, the mind and body are, are an interesting thing because what can happen is if you experience things through all of your senses, you can actually trick your body into thinking it's actually there. Yes. But yes. then you're activating the ventral part of your yes. system. And that um, will interrupt the overwhelm. Yeah, totally makes sense. If you, you know, if you're frightened, you're frozen, and so this part of the brain's just going to be shut down, right? So yeah, part of so the there's the, there's a model about where it flips your lid. I sometimes refer to it when I'm talking to adults as it's like you've had a lobotomy. Yes, yeah. And you can't, you can't, you you physically can't access that that yes. thinking part of your brain. Yes. So as a trauma-based therapist. Polyvagal, like somatic experiencing, 
underpins nearly all the work I do with children and adults. And so I find supporting co-regulation by being aware of my own level of regulation and activation is mm. important. Yes. Especially yes. when they are looking like they're about to deep dive into their own felt sense of their trauma history. Yes. So they they will be reverting to what in the past was had been their survival strategy. Mm. So it's a protective thing that they've done in the past to stay alive. Mm. But even though in reality this danger is no longer present, mm. Mm. and this this can be described around um, the fact that our body senses the level of safety or danger we're in before our brain attaches a story to it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. So state comes before story. Yes. So, and, and another way I might explain that to a parent is around. Um, in these times of COVID-19 when we're all a little anxious about what's happening, you're standing at the supermarket queue and you hear someone cough and splutter behind you. Just even thinking about it, you can (laughs) always feel your body go, brace. Yes, that's your state. And then then the body recognises something's happening, sends messages to the brain, and then the brain sends a message back down to the body. Look around. Oh, they've got a mask on. We're more than 1.5 metres. That to be okay. I'll go home and sterilize myself. I should be okay. Or whatever you do when you're, when you're in a situation like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So state state coming before story also helps people to understand that their body's responding to what they perceive as danger. And yeah. so it's it's not what's wrong with you, it's about what's happening to you. Yes, what's happening to you. Yeah. Yeah. And it's different for every person. Yeah. In that absolutely. example you just gave. So yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, and we've talked about your clay field therapy before um, and it sounds amazing. So can you tell us a little bit about that as well? Sure. So clay field therapy is, um, this is a particular sensory motor art therapy modality and it involves a, a simple rectangular box of clay that the hands are then encouraged to explore. So. The therapy itself involves repetitive movement, um, accessing actions and through impulse, finding an active response that can then be satisfied. So if they want to push or punch it, they can. <laughs> if they, they have control over what they do and this, this allows them to find ways to repair any rupture, which then allows them to move forward. Mm-hmm. So, um, and it's, it's a very powerful modality. Mm-hmm. Um, and I have, I'm on the faculty of the Institute for Sensory Motor Arts Therapy, and mm-hmm. that is the place where you learn how to do clay field therapy in Australia. Mm. So um, the, the principal of that organisation, Cornelia Elbrecht, has, has spent a lot of, many, many years uh, working with the originator, who's Professor Heinz Deuser in Germany, mm-hmm. and um, bringing it into the English-speaking world. So it's it's yeah, it's really powerful. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I know you've got a great example of a young yeah, child that I you worked with. <laughs> I have got an example of this young child. Um, so this is um, there's actually a, a Cornelia is releasing a book on working. Um, in the clay field with children and trauma coming yes. out in the next couple of months actually it's, it's yes it's at the printing press as we speak great and great. and i've uh, written a chapter using this child as an example Good so i'm you. quite comfortable about talking about <laughs> it online because i generally try not to talk specifics about clients because yes obviously yes. for confidentiality reasons yes but um he, after many sessions this this child stuck his head into the clay so he'd done, he'd, yeah, he'd done a whole lot of different things along the way going through the building box of life and then he got to the point where he had this impulse to stick his head in so I said yeah go for it <laughs> and he did and he stuck it in there and when he pulled his head out he had this huge beaming eyes and smile on his face <laughs> and I was able to meet that with a with not saying these words, but with an attitude, welcome, welcome <laughs> back into this space. So it was actually um, it was a birthing experience wow. that he had, and he had a he had a particular <laughs> trauma. Excuse oh, me. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it's all right. 
I can tell you about sneezes too in a minute. <laughs> Great. So Just adding here. some background volume to your story. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> so it, he was actually, without even knowing what he was doing, he was symbolically finding peace and attachment by replicating wow. the birthing process that wow. had not gone well for him in an environment where I was able to offer him care and acceptance. So wow. as I wow. said earlier, he had a particularly traumatic childhood mm-hmm. and, uh, and was in um, kinship care. Yes. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, um, so it was an opportunity to shift some of the patterning from having been put into an adoptive or kinship care situation, mm. um, which obviously in, also involves rejection from the birth family. Yes, correct. So, um, and when, when someone is born and the attachment to the birth parent isn't available, something is missing, mm-hmm. which can often make mm-hmm. it really difficult to find peace mm-hmm. and attachment with mm-hmm. others as they grow. It's, the, it's, it's not a cognitive thing. Yes. It's a felt yes. thing. Yes. And I'm sure you know that with many, many of your families and children from your organisation. Absolutely. Yes. So, so this this lad he he began his sessions prior to going into the clay field, um, building building nests in the play therapy context, mm-hmm. and finished mm-hmm. with the birthing simulation in clay. So that was an opportunity to shift some of the old patterning, and again holding the space and talking with the necessary soft kind eyes within yeah, the process. Absolutely, I can imagine how comforting that. That would have been so. And I speak to some oh, people, the, there's a lot of anger around that, you know, oh, the fact that absolutely. they're adopted. I mean, there's a lot of joy, but there's also a lot of anger um, that's held on yes. to. So, uh, yeah. so and, and not quite understanding the basis for the anger and Correct. not quite understanding, just knowing that there's, uh, I've often had um, clients from this area talk about um, like there's a void there and they've yes. got no yes. idea what to do about it yes and it's almost yeah. a guilt like I mean um, I've got a great family <laughs> I've got a great life but I yeah. still have this anger that that needs to be shifted in some way so yeah. yeah 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 and um your art therapy work as well I guess it's uh yeah a, a so that's yeah, that's, avenue. The, <laughs> yeah that's, that's the sensory motor art therapy so that that is essentially is a body focused therapy that uses the bottom up which sense, which is the felt sense, how the muscles, heart rate, breathing shape our sense of being, mm-hmm. rather mm-hmm. than the top-down approach, which is often what psychology and, and talk therapy Talking. is doing. Mm-hmm. So, um, so it's it's therapy that's done through uh, a couple of different particular modalities, but it's generally through drawing, painting, or sculpting, mm-hmm. and it translates perfectly where memories can't be reached with words such Mm -hmm. as in developmental trauma or that trauma that occurs under the age of five okay so in a safe and a trusting environment the painful or disassociated structures of the past Mm -hmm. they can actually be part of a Mm -hmm. new sensory motor experience where things such as self-esteem self-worth and even empowerment can begin to create new neurological pathways to bypass traumatic memories and restore well-being. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. Um, an example of that is that where I might do something that's called guided drawing, which mm-hmm. is another technique mm-hmm. that, that actually Cornelia Albrecht has developed um, also. Great. And Great. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's drawing from the felt sense, so it's not creating necessarily a visual beauty as in you might from the old masters Mm -hmm. Um, it's more kind of abstract in its concept but it's also about using rhythm and regulation okay so an example where I might use that with a child is um, maybe encouraging them to make a racetrack with the lemnus gate which is sometimes referred to as the lazy eight Mm -hmm. and then um, encouraging them to drive around in it so take their fingers around to drive around or they might take a little car and drive around and this is something that can be done uh drawing Mm -hmm. on on paint 
acting on paper. It can be something to be done with shaving cream and just moving the hands through the shaving cream. Great. It can be something that is done in the sand tray. Move, again, moving the hands through the sand tray using that shape. Um, and if that's a shape that resonates with your child as they like it and it's calming, which a lot of children do, um, yeah, then it actually is helping soothe some wow. of that um, activation. I, I can't think of another word to use. It, it. reminds yeah. me of, um, you know, when you're holding your baby and you, you sort of move in that kind of figure eight. So I can imagine yeah, that would be quite exactly. comforting for children yeah, absolutely. To, to move through that. So, yeah, yeah wow. So what Cornelia has done through her studies with um, over the years is um, built on the, the, the uh, assumption that different movements bring with them a different res felt response in the body. Yes. yes. So there's these, uh, she's identified uh, several uh, archetypal shapes that can either bring a, like a, a rocking yes. soothing type movement or ones that might be stronger and like need to, you know, find your upright. So yes. represented yes. in sitting up and finding, getting strength. So, and there's a whole lot of stuff in between. So, uh, but it's, right. yeah, it's yeah. With children, you're yeah. not actually sitting them down to do guided drawing. You'd be sitting down and say, okay, who wants to make a racetrack today? Yeah. <laughs> Wow, it logically makes a lot of sense to me for sure. So yeah. <laughs> I'm going to be curious to find out what all those shapes are. So, <laughs> well, she runs training on it. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the final one I wanted to chat about as well was sensory motor psychotherapy. Okay, so the sensory motor psychotherapy um, is you're referring there to the work of Pat Ogden? Yes. Yeah. So I actually haven't been trained in Pat Pat's work. Okay. But she, she was a she was a student of Peter Levine. Um, so she started off from somatic experiencing, and then she she branched off and took it into her own specialist area and further developed it that way. So again, mm -hmm. it's another one of the felt sense and working with the felt sense uh, types of, of working. So. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I, I probably can't tell you much more. No, that's about that. so, so, but yeah. I can talk a little bit more about um, working from a trauma informed perspective. Yes, great. Yeah, so that's that's about finding an active response to complete the previous incomplete cycle. Mm -hmm. So it's not about replacing a memory mm -hmm. because. If you've had an experience, you've had an experience. You can't make that go away. Mm -hmm. And as I said earlier, but you can work on taking the sting out of it. Yeah. Yeah. So finding so another way, another active Finding response. another way. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So, for, um, for example, for a child, it might be encouraging them to use a pool noodle and a blow-up bop bag. Mm -hmm. So that's about taking the energy involved in the response and finding a way to move with it. Mm -hmm. So actually whacking the bag with a pull noodle means that the impulse to, to, to do the fight mm -hmm. response has mm -hmm. been answered. Yes. But yes. It's, it's, it's not telling them to go and hit somebody because it's not okay to teach kids to hit other kids or yes. things like that, yes. as we all know. <laughs> but it doesn't mean that the response to, to lash out isn't there. This is a very primal response. Mm -hmm. um, so finding a way for that to happen. And then there's a resonance that comes back that satisfies that, where you don't get that same um, resonance if you're hitting wood on wood or metal on metal because there's a little bit of sponginess and softness in it. Okay. It, actually, it enables the, the hitting, but it's not jarring like the others. So it won't be going straight back in and jarring the joints and things. So it's actually allowing that to have happened. Okay. So the energy <laughs> action involved with that is being completed. So that's that's something that I learned from um, Lisa Dion and synergetic play therapy. So she, uh, I did some training with her. Yes. And this is one of the yes. things that she introduced me to and it's one of the tools that I talk to families about all the time if they've got children that are having a lot of meltdowns or a lot of behavior regulation problems I talk to them that go and buy a pool noodle cut it in half yeah. and just watch what yeah. happens absolutely. Um, absolutely you can use them as swords for sword fighting 
Yes. Um, and you can also direct them to find something in the back garden, for example, or the yard or a fence that they can hit. Not anything that's going to break, of course. Mm -hmm. Something where they can actually get that response out and satisfy it. And um, yeah, it's yeah, I can relate. So yes. I've used it yeah. puddles of water with the kids, and it makes that yes. great whacking sound as well as yes. <laughs> giving yes. you that resonance. So yes. And yeah. yeah, I can attest to the fact that it works. Yeah. <laughs> Helps let off steam. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I mean, elite athletes do a lot of training around helping to um, channel and discharge by using punchy bags and things like that. Yeah. So it's a, as a way of directing and discharging emotion. So it's about noticing the body, what it needs to do, and responding to the impulses associated with those historical imprints. Yes. yes. The old memories implicitly held in the body. Great. So, so the way we respond today comes from our own imprint about how we've responded to things in the past. And if we mm -hmm. come something today that is similar to something we've had in the past, and that, that memory how the body responds will come up, even though it might not be useful in the present. Yeah, but it was absolutely. useful once because you're still here. You're still here talking about it. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. So, um, you're reminding me of how um, valuable karate was in my life as well. <laughs> oh, yes, martial arts—a really good example of doing that. Martial yeah, arts, absolutely. So, didn't know I was getting therapy all the time. <laughs> well, you know, it's a bit of self therapy. I mean, if you've got if you've got um, uh, a sure saw, a saw. Here we shoulder. go. Shoulder. <laughs> shoulder. Those two words are really she hard to say. Yeah. Shells, <laughs> <That's the one. laughs> uh, a pain in the gut or headaches. It may be this is representative of something that is stuck. Yes. And we yes. need to find a bodily way to release that stuckness. Yes. So, an example of this um, is with the uh, clay field, is to encourage them to interact with the clay, to poke it squish take it out build mountains fill, fill water filled lakes build caves all of it requires touch and the mm -hmm. echo that happens from the touch um, speaks back into the body so that that when that touch has been able to complete the impulse the body recognizes it yeah so a child can yeah. do the same thing over and over and over again for several sessions and then not do it anymore mm -hmm. and part of that is because that impulse has been met. Wow. wow. It's so simple, but so, uh, yeah, it's just so life-changing. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. And they, they're in control of what they're choosing to do. So yes, um, yeah. They yeah. get to choose. Yeah, absolutely. So I guess for a lot of families that they've been down that merry-go-round of psychologists, psychiatrists, counselling, you know, talk therapies, cognitive behavioral therapies so um you know and sort of they may not have worked so how do you get started given that often there kind of can be that history of trying to fix things that you know that have had limited or little success so yeah yeah so to start before I start talking about this I just want to affirm that I have the greatest respect for those um, oh, therapy yes. styles, and this is not to poo-poo any of them. Yeah, 100%. they all have their place. <laughs> yeah. So, what I do when I'm working with a family, particularly with children, as I, as I said earlier, I start with the parent session, mm -hmm. and so we do that without the child, and mm -hmm. to look at what help the parent needs, such as they might need some nervous system or somatic work themselves, because the aim is to co-regulate, mm -hmm. and. Mm -hmm. If they've got a dysregulated child, there's no way known they're going to be regulated. Okay. Yeah, because it's just, it just is that the mm -hmm. mirror neurons, the everything that's happening in the family will be creating a whole lot of different levels of anxiety. Mm -hmm. So we discuss the different types of trauma and what they might mean. We explore polyvagal theory in more detail. Mm -hmm. And I often mm -hmm. use the example of um, a three-month-old baby. Okay. And so this example I use is around, um, okay, so you've got a three-month-old baby and anyone with a three-month-old baby knows it's really hard to be able to have time to go to the bathroom and have oh, a shower yes. and do those things. 
So the baby's been fed and changed and you think that everything's okay. So you pop them on a nice little sleeping arrangement and um, you, you head out of the room to have a shower, thinking <laughs> the baby's about to nod off to sleep. So if that baby seeks you with a cry and you don't mm-hmm. respond because you're in the shower, mm-hmm. um, there's a potential there for a rupture to the felt sense of safety to the child. Mm-hmm. Because the concept of she's going to come back or he's going to come back is an adult concept. Mm-hmm. What the thing the baby, the only thing the baby knows is either you're there or you're not there. Yes. And if you're there, their world feels safer. Mm-hmm. Hopefully. Mm-hmm. And then if you're not there, they will feel very unsafe and very, very vulnerable. Okay. So if you've had this happen, you know, once, twice, or sometimes things only need to happen once and they get stuck in your system. Mm-hmm. But if then if you fast forward five or ten or more years, and that child um, may have actually developed anxiety about being left. And you might mm-hmm. end up with an adult who has um, great difficulty in their relationships and friendships, thinking that people will be there for them. Okay. Yeah, because the original mm-hmm. rupture potentially was never repaired. Mm-hmm. And you may not know that the baby was crying if you if the baby starts crying before you leave Mm. you'll return and come back and soothe Mm. and everything is good and you think okay I'll do it later today or tomorrow or whenever Mm -hmm. but if um if you're in the shower and don't hear the cry and you come out and the baby's asleep you may not necessarily know that there has been this rupture occur oh yeah and um so be, yeah. being becoming oh, yeah. Yeah, being stuck in your system in a physical way and manifesting as anxiety brings up those feelings of feeling abandoned, isolated and alone. Yeah. 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 I used to so take most, the kids into the bathroom in the little baby carrier while I oh, showered. So <laughs> I know I mean, exactly I know, what you're talking about. Know, <laughs> yeah, my, own, my own grandchildren have often been showered with one of their parents at the same time so you know they're handed in and off you go and things like that so yeah it's um they they just because there's you know there's a school of thought with the with all the new knowledge that comes through from neuroscience and and what's come from there is that a a baby really shouldn't be more than a meter and a half away from its caregiver for the Mm -hmm. first few weeks of life Mm -hmm. yes which is goes very much against when my children were uh, born where you put them in a separate room altogether. Yes. As soon as you got home from hospital. Yes, true. Yeah. Yeah. Or, the, or when you're in hospital, they were kept in the nursery and they're only brought to you at the designated feeding time. Yeah. So you really couldn't even do demand feeding, which is yeah. you know, responding to the felt need of the child. Absolutely. And they're so noisy sometimes too, right? <laughs> so yes. if, if you know how important that is, you'll kind of work through that and rise above it. So yeah. And Absolutely. I know for me, it's too noisy. It's like, you've got to go to another room. <laughs> or you're constantly up seeing, making sure that they're still existing. Yes. <laughs> that, that horrible fear of the first time the baby sleeps through and getting up to check it out, to make yes. sure that everything's okay. okay. That's an awful fear that yeah. parents have. Absolutely. So most parents kind of get the work that I do when I talk to them about it because mm-hmm. they've often spent years trialing a lot of different therapies. Yes, um, yes. that might not might not have hit the mark for them so mm-hmm. it's not about parent blaming or victimizing because everyone's trying to do the best that they can with what they know yes and as I said as a parent yes. and a grandparent myself I know that sometimes we feel very inadequate or guilty or perhaps we might realize that maybe we we're too stern or yes. rigidly disciplining yes. or too laissez-faire for example mm-hmm. but we only know mm-hmm. what we know until someone opens us up to new knowledge and new ways of looking at things yes yes so my sessions take place with the child on their own ideally mm-hmm. however where a child is too anxious the parent might sit in until such a time that the child is more attuned with me mm-hmm. and feels safe in the environment and then comfortable to move forward just the two of us in the room together mm-hmm. So um, we kind of, yeah, we meet, initially we'll meet weekly, um, sometimes two sessions a week for the first little bit, mm-hmm. and then we'll gradually gradually move to fortnightly. 
Okay. And it's, yeah. Because trauma-based therapeutic work takes time. It's very soft and gentle work. Mm -hmm. So it might mean that mm -hmm. there's a long-term commitment that's going to be required for this. Yes. Um, and we're constantly looking for points of um, satisfaction in the system where an activity might shift and change to show that whatever they've been working on has has achieved what it needed to and then they move on to the next thing yeah i think it's an so, important yeah. reminder that it does take yeah. time so it does take time there's no there's no miracle work here and so a child might play in one activity as i said earlier for weeks and weeks and weeks and then suddenly drop it because mm -hmm. the active response has been found and it's no longer impacting on them in the same way mm. so good so i'm sitting mm. here thinking about my daughter learning to swim and the teacher saying to me you know I just don't really want to push her and me saying I'll give you permission not to push her that's absolutely fine yeah and four or five weeks later everything clicked and everything yep. moved forward so and I look back now and think about this felt safety and she just needed to find that that spot in that swim class that it was a safe space to be and she could go at her own pace so absolutely yeah. yeah yeah so yeah um and so i guess you know for yourself you've got all this knowledge so you can use all all your skills when you're working with a child but is there you know a way of knowing what therapy works best for what what child um i guess well when i meet with the child and I, if I find that they're anxious or worried, mm -hmm. that's actually about them not feeling safe. Mm -hmm. So I think the first thing I do is gently uh, work on developing rapport. So that, again, is still meeting them with the soft, kind eyes mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. helping to instill that felt sense of safety. And once the child begins to understand that they'll be invited to play, they soon relax and realise that it's a safe and fun environment in which they can relax. Mm. and so that um that's that's one part of it but it's also important that i um, am able to support the parents and that the parents understand how they can support the child yes. while the child is yes. going through therapeutic work so that's about letting parents know that it's it's probably best that they don't go doing any probing or asking questions post session about what was done in therapy yes. um, because the child yes. will naturally discuss what when what they want to discuss when they're ready to reveal uh, what they've been doing when they feel it's safe enough to talk about it and and also it's important not to undermine the process that's happening with lots of questions yes so yes. It's, it's essentially an intuitive process mm -hmm. that I use when it comes to which mm -hmm. of the therapies will work for the child I'm constantly watching their interaction with me with materials and with themselves mm -hmm. to see if they might be mm -hmm. indicating that they have sensory needs or mm -hmm. if they have mm -hmm. um, uh, I'm just trying to think uh, one of the ways I might see if if there's if they respond well to sensory needs is I have a couple of um, beautifully soft pastry brushes mm -hmm. really soft pastry, pastry brushes that are not to be used for painting or anything they sit there and if the child looks like they're responding well to some sensory work I might gently brush their hands with these um, pastry brushes it's also can be a little bit of bilateral stimulation because I'm also trained in EMDR yeah, yeah. yeah. right and um, and just you, if this is something that resonates with the child, you can see them just like you can see them blissing out with it and really <laughs> enjoying it. And it's also really lovely with the young ones if they then pick the brushes up and want to do it to me. Okay. So that's that nice reciprocity aspect yes. that comes into it. Yeah. Because touch is the first way we learn, and it's an important part of any sensory motor work. Mm -hmm. So I might invite them to engage with the kinetic sand, the shaving cream, painting with their hands as brushes mm -hmm. or using Play-Doh, using the Play-Doh to put in balloons and make little stress balls they can keep in their pockets for school. Oh, wow. but for some children, it may be um, pointing them in the direction of the Playmobil characters in the playroom and the dolls' houses. And so they, they then might engage in making little or narrating little family-based stories, which is, you know, them 
play is the work of children. So they're actually telling you what's happening for them through their play. And um, if, for example, if they might need to organize some safe groupings, um, it could be that they're trying to um, move from the chaos that they're experiencing and unsafety into a preferred environment. Okay. So by being interested in them and not telling them where to put things or what to do next, the child will actually seek what they need as they become more confident mm -hmm. and will allow themselves to respond to their impulses associated with may have been what may have been previously thwarted active mm -hmm. responses. Mm -hmm. It's like, don't be silly, sit down and be quiet. Mm -hmm. um, stop making noise. You know, that stuff that, that can happen when... Um, children are, are trying to show us or tell us something that's really important to them mm -hmm. and because we're um, disengaged they're not getting mm -hmm. that attention this is the, one of the huge problems with mobile phones mm -hmm. huge problems mm -hmm. that, that the children mm -hmm. become quite disengaged mm -hmm. um, some, and sometimes a child might actually turn the whole playroom upside down so <laughs> I have to work on keeping my system regulated so they don't pick up on my neurons of being, whoa, I've got to clean all this up afterwards. So, yeah, absolutely. So yeah, and the space yeah. is not a parent space generally, so the child can do anything they want without being told to clean up. But if, yeah. they, if that's something that they insist that they want to do, then I'm not going to stop them because they get to choose what they do. Yeah. What's and I not let to love them the know child? that they can... <laughs> Well, exactly. I wish someone <laughs> would do that for me in real life. <laughs> Absolutely. So I let them know that they can do almost anything that they want to do mm. and that if something isn't going to be okay to do for safety reasons or practical reasons, that I will help them find another way to answer that impulse or that need that they have. Wow. So wow. it's also about taking away the shame factor and letting the body do what it needs to do to repair Mm -hmm. So, again, it's not about what's wrong with you. It's about what's happened to you. Yeah. What a great space. So would you like a little example about yeah. what happened yeah. to one child? Yeah. Yes. So, so one child I was working with was selectively mute. And uh, this little one was four. And I could hear her in the waiting room with her um, parent carer before I came to collect her and she would be chattering away and as soon as I walked into the space she'd go quiet and then she'd happily come into the playroom but wouldn't say a word oh. wouldn't say a thing and then after we finished I'd take her back out and she would be fine and then I could hear them as they left the building she started talking to a parent here again wow I thought this is interesting and this this wasn't just just me this has happened whenever something interrupted into that little bond that she had with a pet, which was a kinship wow. carer. Mm -hmm. And I put there in, per she's in permanent care with this kinship carer. Mm -hmm. Again, a very traumatic history. Um, so we had about 15 sessions doing things like colouring in rainbows in different colours and before she actually spoke. And when she spoke, it was, it was in response to, oh, that's a nice colour. I wonder what colour that you're going to choose next type of comment. Mm -hmm. And she just looked at me and said blue. <laughs> and I, thought, and I, I, just, I didn't go hooray, which is what I was feeling like inside. <laughs> I think that's a terrific colour to use next. Would you like the light blue or dark? But we need to go sort of conversations. And then when she realised that I was able to tolerate her at the level of chaos that she was in when she was mute, that there was a whole lot of stuff happening for her, mm -hmm. then she could start to repair and start to communicate. So wow. the child needs to be seen, heard, understood and accepted unconditionally in that sense of belonging rather than surrounded by disenchantment. Yes. And yes. As, as time went on and um, uh, I'm not seeing her at the moment because life's pretty good for her at the moment. Right. But it, it, it turned more into um, the uh, the mum carer saying, I guess you've got to be careful what you wish for, don't you? <laughs> she <laughs> just became an absolute chatterbox because she had so much to chat to people about. Yes. She was holding it in. So, yes. yeah. Wow. Yeah. 
Wow, what what an amazing turnaround! So, and how yeah. rewarding for you to have that experience. Oh, so, yeah. yeah, I mean, there's there's many times when I even now I can feel a little bit of emotion coming up, but yeah, um, it is it's 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 heartwarming to your very core when you see a, a child start to feel safer in the world. Yeah, absolutely. So, wow. And perseverance, hats off to you. I'm not sure I could sit there for 15 <laughs> sessions. <laughs> <laughs> and that's it. That's what it takes sometimes, right? That yeah. constant repetition and, and meeting the need so many times over and over and over again. So, yep. Um, yep. yeah, it's great. So is there anything else important that we should talk about today in regards to, you know, families formed through adoption, kinship or permanent care? That we haven't covered already <laughs> well I guess um I, I just want to um share my thoughts on this that if a child is not with their birth mother for whatever reason mm -hmm. then that child will, will absolutely will have experienced trauma and disruption to attachment mm -hmm. and then any work with children and actually adults too who, who are working on their own histories of this mm. Who have experienced this will be best served with lots of unconditional positive regard. Yes. Uh, lots of understanding and support to brave the fear and the held trauma that bubbles underneath the abandonment that occurred in whatever form that might be. Mm. And again, not about blaming and shaming, this is understanding that this is their reality. Mm. So, um, I, because I've spoken a lot about sensory mo motor art therapy and the work that I do, it may have piqued some interest in some people. So I just might let um, mention that if anyone's interested in learning more about sensory motor art therapy, because it is something mm -hmm. that you can include in social work, psychology, psychiatry, nursing, teaching, you can bring the, the techniques into any other profession that you might have. Mm -hmm. I would... Um, encourage them to check out the offerings on the Institute for Sensory Motor Art Therapies website. Mm -hmm. They run in-person trainings down in Apollo Bay mm -hmm. and we also run online trainings uh, okay. in um, sensory motor art therapy techniques. So, um, so there's both professional training and there's also weekend workshops on offer and that um, it can support people to become more trauma informed and consider a more body based way of working with that Absolutely. trauma. Absolutely. I think you've inspired me. I'm going to go get a, an old canvas out and throw some paint on it and get everyone else in the family to do a bit of <laughs> sensory finger Thank painting. You. Yeah, use it. Oh, I will warn you be careful not to use the term finger painting because oh. if you say that to people, they'll go, I'm not a baby. Oh, yes. But if you say, <laughs> let's use our hands as paintbrushes. <laughs> okay, I'll response. keep that in mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're all over 16, so I'll need to use that kind of phrasing. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> oh, well, thank you so much for all the content that you shared today. It's just invaluable content to keep reminding our families about in terms of that felt safety and and giving children time and and that we all have our own you know things that we hold on to as well that we need to to Absolutely. be aware of so yeah. Um, yeah yeah so I really appreciate it um and for anyone else who's making the time to listen to this podcast thank you for giving up your valuable time and if you're a permanent care or adoptive or kinship uh, parent or family needing support please contact permanent care and adoptive families on 9020 until next time have an amazing week Thank you.